you might notice something a little different about the sanctuary. I hope you noticed. There's this curtain of uh, looped little pieces of paper, different colors. But what they represent, it's over 7,000 pieces of paper that were stapled and made into chains. Um, This weekend, uh, we're recognizing the 30-hour famine. There was a group of students here and leaders on uh, Friday through Saturday. And I had the honor of helping them break the fast at 6 p.m. yesterday with communion around the altar. That curtain represents over 7,000 pieces of paper, but it really represents 7,000 or more children, age five or less, who die every day from hunger. And so as beautiful as it is, it represents something that weighs heavily on us. And so as we worship today, we remember them and uh, take a little extra moment to consider what that means for us um, as Christians. Let us begin with our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who shines in glory, clothes us in compassion, and bears gifts of mercy for all. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, let us confess our sin with confidence in God's promise of forgiveness. God, wonderful counselor, we confess. God's loving kindness has appeared to us in Christ our Savior. We are saved by God's mercy, poured out on us richly. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sin is forgiven through the Spirit living in you. God give you faith to trust Jesus, who is love born and revealed for you now and always. Let us sing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus, make us instruments of your peace, that where there is hatred, we may so love, where there is injury, pardon, and where there is despair, hope. Grant, O divine Master, that we may seek to console, to understand, and to love in your name. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading for today is found in the 45th chapter of Genesis. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, Because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, and to keep alive for you many survivors. 
So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. You have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. The word of the Lord. The psalm for today is from Psalm 37, and let us read it responsively. Do not be provoked by evildoers. Do not be jealous of those who do wrong. Put your trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and find safe pasture. Commit your way to the Lord. Put your trust in the Lord and see what God will do. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently. Do not be provoked by the one who prospers, the one who succeeds in evil schemes. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who hope in the Lord shall possess the land. But the lowly shall possess the land. They will delight in abundance of peace. You, O Lord, will help them and rescue them. You will rescue them from the wicked and deliver them because in you they seek refuge. The second reading is from the first book of Corinthians, the 15th chapter. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Fool, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And as for what you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be, but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a physical body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the physical, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust so are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, 
so are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel on this day according to Luke, the sixth chapter. Glory Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said, But I say to you that, listen, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much gain again. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Well, dear saints of grace, perfect performers of all those um, commands of Jesus, you're all doing well, aren't you? Grace and peace to you from God our Creator and from our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. What is your life for the sake of? That's one of the guiding questions for me as I approach this scripture. What is your life for the sake of? There's a lot of advice out there on how to behave as human beings, isn't there? Yeah. It seems that uh, we have worked out, supposedly, through research, the number of positive comments we need to give to one another for every negative one. My wife is a first grade teacher this year, and she has learned about this system called PBIS, Positive Behavior Instructional System or Strategy, something like that. And the ratio that they're working with in the school systems is four to one. Four positives for every one um, less positive or, or, uh, or critique, we could say. Yeah. So um, from Harvard, Harvard Business Review, I have a few things to, to read. As an interesting aside, we find it noteworthy that this research is echoed in an uncanny way by John Gottman's analysis of wedded couples' likelihood of getting divorced or remaining married. 
once again, the single biggest determinant in the ratio is the ratio of positive to negative comments that the partners make to one another. And the optimal ratio is amazingly similar. Five positive comments for every negative one. The Odafers are laughing at one another right now, wondering if they're matching up to this. And then, um, in parentheses, here's this quote. For those who ended up divorced, the ratio was 0.77 to 1, or something like three positive comments for every four negative ones. Yeah. And then the article continues on. Clearly, in work and life, both negative and positive feedback have their place and their time. But the key, even here, is to keep the opposing viewpoint rational, objective, and calm, and above all, not to engage in any personal attack under the disingenuous guise of being, quote, constructive. And then um, the final paragraph. We submit that all leaders should be aware of the ratio of positive. Now, this is in the business setting, of course. Uh, should be aware of the positive and negative comments and the ratio of that made by their colleagues in leadership team meetings and endeavor to move the proportion closer to the ideal of 5.6 to 1. So I guess I'm going to have to start counting, right? I need to have 5.6 to 1. Well, here in Luke, Jesus continues his sermon to his disciples. He's still in the midst of his um, family meeting with us. He is sharing with us his vision of our behavior. Something to note here is that Jesus had only just designated his 12 disciples, his apostles, the inner circle of his companions along the way. And as Luke tells the story, Jesus had been in prayer on a mountain all night long. And uh, here's the verse that grabbed me. And when day came... Jesus called his disciples and chose 12 of them. So we can assume that there was a large crowd of disciples around him. And he chose 12 of them, whom he also named apostles. And immediately after this episode, the lessons begin. So there are healings and removal of spirits, evil spirits, and a great crowd of people. It's quite a scene. Now, I can't help but think that the crowds are still pressing in when Jesus looks up and focuses on his disciples. Have you been in a, in a group in the midst of a large, noisy place? Think of an uh, airport or an arena. And in order to hear what's going on from your leader, to hear what they're trying to say, you have to, you have to lean in and try to close out everything else around you. This is a good mental image for what's going on with Jesus and his disciples. And Jesus speaks blessings and woes, which was our text last week. I think it's helpful to think of all of these in the context of living now for the sake of as the good news of Jesus spreads to more people, those who are caught up in his life begin to live for the sake of a greater purpose than their own well-being. We move away from protectionist thinking and we move toward a pro-communal way of life. Today's sayings include phrases that are probably familiar to us, and one of them is what we call the golden rule. Do to others as you would have them do to you. This is for the sake of the gospel, which is for the sake of the redemption of the whole world. Do to others 
as you would have them do to you. These sayings are ways to go beyond getting along as neighbors and communities. They are ways to present Christ to the world. They all give us much to ponder. They have a way of pointing out our failings and at the same time freeing us up to be better images of God for those around us. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. On and on. Bring the endless life of God to those larger struggles that you have and the ones that you see around you. Even if you decide to go with the ratio of 5.6 to 1, you can see it as a way to be the body of Christ for the world. And I'm wondering, what do we need to hear today? You are beloved. God has been revealed for you in Jesus Christ. You are part of that circle. You have been brought in through the love and mercy of God. Your baptismal calling is to delve deeper into your identity and see it as a gift for the world. Ask yourself, what is your life for the sake of? I challenge all of us to view the cross perhaps less as a footbridge for the individual to get to heaven. And I challenge us to view the cross rather as a statement by God, the creator and renewer of the world. God is willing to suffer with the suffering, with the 7,000 children who are at death's door because of hunger. God is willing to suffer along with us and bring the dead to life, leaving death behind. This is God's radical and final way of mending the entire universe. Love your enemies. Do good. Forgive. All of these are high marks, high bars for us. And in Christ, as we live in community with one another, these things become miraculous new opportunities for us to live out the gospel. Amen. United as one body in Christ, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. We pray for the church. Fill us with a spirit of generosity and care. Lead us to forgive as we have been forgiven. Show us new ways to be helpful to others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the earth, grant seasonable weather for the planting and harvesting of crops. Protect farms, orchards, and gardens from damage. Bless those who till fields, those who care for livestock, and all who provide food. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the nations, for all researchers and leaders who work to resolve complex issues, for all who teach peace and reconciliation to communities in conflict, for those affected by earthquake, drought, or storms, and all who come to their aid. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those in need, for those who lack adequate food, shelter, or access to medical care, for those unable to find gainful employment, heal the sick and comfort the grieving. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For this assembly, inspire us to be good stewards of the resources you have entrusted to us. 
Teach us to give freely of ourselves and to offer our lives in service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the hungry today, be with all who lack food and give us the will to provide for all. Bless those who learned what hunger meant during the 30-hour fast. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With thanksgiving, we remember those who have died, even in the midst of death. Give us faith to trust your promise of everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive our prayers and fill us with the radiance of your love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.